when I'm working with my clients, it's always um, next six to 12 months. Don't, you know, don't think about the past. Don't think about in five years time when the business is, you know, four times the size. In the next six to 12 months, what structure does the business need? And just keep reviewing it. I dis- uh, strongly discourage, is that the right term? Um, people to change it in between sessions. Let's agree to this is for the next six months. And, you know, unless something goes terribly wrong, uh, let's work with this. We've agreed as a leadership team that this is what we're going to run with for the next six months. Welcome to the latest edition of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and today I've got our co-host, Jenny Cliff, with us. Welcome to the studio, Jenny. Thanks, Deborah. Good to be here. Yeah. So um, as I think a couple of months ago, we actually introduced Jenny and Nick, and they're going to be co-hosting the series. Uh, we've been running through a few technical issues in the meantime, but Jenny's got some really great guests lined up, and so we'll be seeing more of those over the next few months, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but today I'm actually going to quiz Jenny a little bit because we did our tips and tricks series and we had such a great response from that. And we've had a few more questions come out of that. So today I just want to talk about some of the things that have come out of it and get Jenny to answer some questions for us. So Jenny, one of the things was that, you know, people sort of say, hey, look, we've read the Traction book and there's this great thing called the VTO or the eight questions. And, you know, surely that's the first place that I start. And we say, well, no, there's actually a different way of doing it. But people don't understand why. And I think that's the the easy go to is to go, well, let's just answer these eight questions. But what what is the EOS proven process and why does it work? Yeah, it's interesting. The um, you know, most people just want to get started, and particularly in the entrepreneur sp- space, we uh, we all just want to you know jump in, you know, feet first, and and kick things off, and and feel like we're we're making progress. So so I guess as an implementer, it's it's kind of about slowing down and putting those f- foundations. And and I always explain it as you know, it's a bit like building a house. You know, you you start, you've got your block of land, you've demolished the old property that was there, or you know, you're starting afresh. And they come in and they build all of those foundations and send you a bill for a whole bunch of money and you go out and look at it and think, well, apart from a few pipes sticking out of the ground, it doesn't look any different. So it's that sort of process. It's really uh, what we want to do is build those really strong foundations and make sure that the leadership team really have the skills that they need to, um, you know, to underpin the business and the rest of the team and and start the process strong. Um, mm. So we go through a few things like, you know, hitting the ceiling. What does that mean? And that's, you know, every person, every team, every, uh, you know, it it could be a department or it could be the whole business, hits a ceiling where you get stuck. You don't know how to get past whatever it it is. And it it may be, um, you know, a person that, um, you know, they've just reached the end of their capacity or, you know, maybe the the products that you're selling uh, or the, um, you know, the the way that you're doing things needs to change in a way. So building, uh, you know, teaching the principle of hitting the ceiling and then we teach some, um, some, ways of of moving forward um we we look at the accountability chart and really sort of look at that um you know what structure does the business need and you know not um, as most of us do as entrepreneurs who do we have and then creating those roles and i'm sure you've seen the same thing yes. you know um you know i've got this great person who's really good at x so we'll put a, you know create a role for them but it's not really what the business needs and we're always saying you know let's build the accountability chart for the next 6 to 12 months it's not set in stone um and we went through when we started uh, the EOS process in our business back in what, 2017, um, you know, what it looked like in, even in our first day, that focus day was very different, six months, 12 months and two years later. And then, you know, getting the, as in our day together, we go through and, and build that accountability chart for the leadership team and, and then set the team off, uh, leadership team to go and build their own um, accountability chart with their own teams. We set some rocks and that's those, you know, setting those goals. And really I view that in that first day as a bit of a a learning exercise, teaching people how to um, set rocks that are smart, so specific, Mm. measurable, attainable or achievable, um, realistic, time-bound, but also teaching some tools on how to get those rocks done, how to set something in the time frame still got to do your, your job and you know manage your team and do all of the other things so setting something you can actually achieve in that you know in that time frame um, something that will move the business forward but some tools to 
make sure that you're allocating time each week towards getting that rock done because it's so easy to go back and just get back into the weeds mm -hmm. and not uh, not get those done um, and do what we did. You know, we got to the end of our first quarter and at, you know, in each of our weekly L10s, it's saying, yeah, yeah, you know, rock's on track, on track. And at week 11 over the 12, 13 week quarter, um, saying to the other people on the leadership team, does anybody remember what, what my rock was? Because I don't and I haven't actually started it yet uh, with a few tiers involved. Um, we teach the meeting pulse and that is teaching the level 10 agenda, but also what meetings does the business need? Who's in them? How long do they go for? Um, so really setting the, the, the that pulse or the cadence of the meetings. And then we take a first shot at the scorecard. So, you know, what, um, you know, using my analogy of, you know, you're on a Greek island and on a Monday afternoon, you, they, you know, somebody comes out with your, your margarita and your, um, your scorecard. It's the only information you have in the business. What are those critical numbers that you need to know? So it's really setting those foundations and starting um, the leadership team thinking in a different way before you get into uh, the next two days, which are, are that vision building and answering those eight questions. Yeah. And I think Gina kind of said, it really well you know vision without traction is hallucination and so our, our process is about actually instilling some traction some discipline and some accountability before we get into that sort of um, stronger vision building and I guess you know a lot of clients kind of go oh but how can you possibly set rocks which is your short-term focus for the stuff that makes the business go better how can you set them if you don't know what the vision is but the reality is these clients they've been around for quite some time they're established they've actually got it they've all got a vision right absolutely it's they've just got not it in articulated their heads. yeah it's just yeah. Articulated particularly well, or even sometimes yep. it's articulated. I have to laugh because I've had a couple of clients where you know they'll come in, they go, "Oh yeah, no, we've got we've got a vision, we've got a mission state, we've got our core values." Like, great, my life is going to be so much easier in this focus day. Let's give it a go. And you go, right? Can somebody tell me what our vision is? And they kind of go, hmm. Yeah, I think um, it was something about yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does anybody remember? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, we've got great values. They're so strong. We've got seventeen of them. Does yeah. anybody remember? Uh, and two people can remember one each. Yeah, <laughs> I know that's, I think seven is probably a little bit of exaggeration, but I've certainly had companies who've come in and they've got nine kind of core values and you go, well, that's really, really great. But if if you do ask the team right here, right now, who, let's face it, is the, the leadership team, therefore should be the people most attached to these values. What are they? They really struggle to come up with more than sort yeah. of two or three. So, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So so this focus day is designed to set up the team for with all the really, really good tools that they need to be really good leaders in the business. Um, and to take them forward. And the accountability chart, let's talk a little bit about that because this is something that I think is quite unique to EOS. And I think particularly the fact that we have this thing called a visionary role, um, which I think uh, I, I, I suddenly clicked for me a few a few weeks ago when somebody said to me that the thing that I love about EOS is I have got a role in this business now um, that is really clearly defined. And that was the person who owned the business, which is often mm -hmm. the visionary. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that accountability chart. What's the role of the visionary? what's an integrator what does that look like so the visionary usually is the owner of the business it's the person who it's, it's their baby they've created the business they've come up with this great idea and you know to pro provide their product their service whatever that is and then built a business out of it so it's that person that really thinks big picture you know sits at 30,000 feet doesn't do detail has the big relationships so the big clients the big vendors the you know the people the industry peers but it's that person who you know when you ask them about their business they can just talk for hours about it um, but they you know how they actually do it often they're like oh, I don't know I've got people for that mm -hmm. um, and they're really good at surrounding themselves with great people and um, and the other thing, they really drive the culture of the business. They set the tone of, um, you know, how their business does things and their day-to-day -day interactions, the people within the business. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I love the, the term visionary because it is, it's the person with that really strong vision of, of what that business is about. <laughs> So quite often in businesses that we work with, that visionary is actually wearing more than one hat though, aren't they? So they surround themselves with all these great people and yet they're still trying to hold on to a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks. They're still trying to actually run the business. What's the danger of having a visionary kind of in the business, sort of running the business? So having been married to a highly visionary person who I've worked <laughs> alongside for nearly 27 years, 
Nick and I would go off to a conference, an industry conference, and we would come back to our office and there would be nobody there. Like it's the old shoot a cannon through the office and not you know hit anybody. Our staff would just disappear for the first few days after we back came back because I'm visionary as well, not as highly visionary as Nick, but I certainly have visionary traits. We would come back with these great ideas of all of these things that we could implement in the business. Mm-hmm. So we'd come back and we would just derail all of our staff from whatever they were working on with all of these great ideas and a highly visionary person um, normally within a couple of days has forgotten about all those great ideas and moved on with even more great ideas and one of Nick's more famous ideas is he said to me came to me one day so excited a few years ago and he said I think we should get a robot for the office and I said "Um, okay and what exactly would this robot do he said, I have no idea, but it would be so cool. And it's only, you know, it's under $10,000. I said, mm, okay. Um, so why don't you go and put a bit more thought and research into said robot and we'll talk about it later. And ultimately the answer was no. Had he gone to our staff, which is what he always did prior to implementing that structure around the visionary, the integrator, the heads of departments, he would have gone straight to a few of our techs, sold this great idea of a, a robot. They would have gone off and started developing the robot because how cool is would it to be have you know, to have a robot in the office when you're an IT business? Not done their job, not supported our clients, and got completely distracted with a robot. For absolutely no reason. Like our, our business did not need a robot. Yeah. Um, so that's the, I guess, the threat of a visionary, these great ideas. And when the owner of a business comes to you as an employee and says, go do this, you do it, Yeah. particularly if it's fun. <laughs> so a visionary can really be a big distraction, uh, an organisational whiplash. You know, you're going down this path and then all of a sudden you're going down a completely different path. You're not quite sure why, but the owner says we are, so we are. So it's all over the shop. And then you get this, um, you know, going back to what I started with about, you know, coming back from a conference and nobody there, people would go into hiding when we came back from these conferences because they knew we'd come back with all of these great ideas and they were, I think they were just over it. Yeah. Well, because I know what it leads to is, is that, as you said, they're going to jump when the owner says jump and they're going to say how high. Um, and you see teams, even really long established teams that are working ridiculously long hours. Mm-hmm. And when you look into it, it's because they're always trying to execute on the latest, greatest idea that's come yeah, through. Yeah. And they never quite get around to finish it before the next one's thrown at them and the next one. And so they're just um, almost like chasing their tail the whole time to try and, and keep a, up And a things. trail of destruction. Yeah. yeah. Half, pretty, half finished projects and, and you know, half baked ideas yeah so yeah. I think when we go to when we go to businesses and, and we actually say to these people hey look we've got this box that's called the visionary box and this is what you're going to be doing you know you're still going to have those big relationships you're still going to have those really big ideas but you don't need to get involved in the sort of the day-to-day um, running of the business or leading the team that's going to be done Absolutely. by this integrator role yeah. you can see them almost kind of light up and go oh so I have one of my clients today say well it felt like a huge weight had been lifted off his shoulders mm. that suddenly he didn't have to do it all yeah yeah. And the integrator, which is, you know, that, um, you know, every great visionary needs a great integrator. Mm-hmm. And the integrator is there, you know, they're far more detailed. Um, they're more where the visionary is often quite emotional driven, not an emotional person, but driven on emotions and excitement and mm-hmm. shiny objects. The integrator is usually more logic based. So, um, you know, they usually have a responsibility for delivering on the business plan and, you know, delivering on the financial aspect of the business, um, special projects, leading the heads of the departments. And their job really is to execute the ideas of the visionary that have been deemed to be the way forward. Should, I should say sanitise. They've kind of gone through a process. <laughs> That's of, a good okay, word. Yeah, I like yeah. that word. <laughs> yeah. And so one of I, I sat in the integrator role for probably 10 years in our business with Nick as visionary and he would come to me with his great ideas and a big part of my role was to say no. Mm-hmm. Um, or actually I really like that idea, Nick. Can you go away and put some more thought into it and come back? Sometimes he got 
went off on other tangents and didn't. But, um, you know, it would be, oh, you know, yeah, that's a terrible idea. No, 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 oh, I like that one. So mm -hmm. it's just constantly listening. So the visionary can still come up with those great ideas, yeah. give them to somebody who actually listens and then executes on the things that will move the business forward. And then, of course, so that comes into the structure of the, having the rocks and being really laser sharp focused on what's important as well. Because um, if you haven't got that um, laser sharp focus, if everything's important, nothing's important. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, it, so this is one of the foundational tools that we use. It's called the accountability chart. I mean, it really is, as you said, we've got to think about structure first, people second. We've got to think very, very much what does this business need? And it is a document that changes, right? This is not something you kind of put like the, the traditional organizational chart. Here is the here's the title here's the name of the person and then almost that never really gets reviewed until we go through restructures and things yep. whereas the accountability chart is really a a living breathing kind of document that helps people understand who is responsible or accountable for something but absolutely. it is reviewed on a regular basis particularly in a high growth company right absolutely yeah and it's and we went through this you know in probably in our first two years of implementing eos into our business you know what we set in the um you know, in that first focus day, I don't know if it was our second quarterly. So we went through the vision building process and I think might have been sort of, you know, 180 days later, we looked at it and said, it's there's just something not working here. So we spent quite a bit of time in that quarterly going through and and I think we'd can't, we'd probably got caught up being new to the process and learning and um, we'd diluted it to the leadership team uh we had too many people on on that leadership team mm -hmm. so we said okay how do we fix this because it's just not working and I, I, you know when i'm working with my clients it's always um next six to 12 months don't you know don't think about the past don't mm -hmm. think about in five years time when the business is you know four times the size in the next six to 12 months what structure does the business need yeah. and just keep reviewing it i disc uh strongly discourage is that the right term um people to change it in between sessions mm -hmm. let's agree to this is for the next six months yeah. and you know unless something goes terribly wrong mm -hmm. uh, let's work with this we've agreed as a leadership team that this is what we're going to run with for the next six months yeah and it's basically identified all the major functions so really that's not going to change in that next six months um no. but but yeah. we do need to review it every six to 12 yeah. months to go is yeah. it still right yeah and if somebody leaves then normally at that leadership team level, if there's a, a, a vacant role on the leadership team, the integrator steps in and fills that until you follow until until you fill it externally, internally. Um, mm -hmm. But the role doesn't change. It might yeah. be a bit different person, but the actual role stays as it is. Mm, absolutely. Okay. Cool. So I mean, that's as it's one of the fundamental things I loved about it was the fact that it is a, it's about accountabilities. It really clearly spells out what you're accountable for. Um, we do it based on the structure first, then put the person in there, and it means when you've got it fleshed out for the whole organisation, anybody can look at the whole org chart and go, "I need. I've got an issue with customer complaints. Ah, oh, that's the person who's accountable for it, and they can actually go and find. Yeah, they know exactly who is who to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. exactly. Yeah. And then that tends to feed into one of our other foundational tools, which is the scorecard, right? Yep. So the tell us a bit about this because scorecard is part of the data component. Tell us a little bit about scorecards and why they're important. So the scorecard and some uh, some of the questions I get asked about the scorecard in in our focus day, we set the scorecard for the leadership team. Mm -hmm. So you know if the owner of the business is on you know sitting on their Greek island or whatever their happy place may be, and they get that scorecard on a Monday afternoon with their cocktail. Mm -hmm. They can look through that and say, everything's on track and I can get another cocktail or mm, well, things are a little getting a bit wobbly. I need to get on the phone or, oh, my God, I need to book a flight home. Yeah. So you really, what are those critical numbers? So usually it's things like, you know, cash at bank, um, something around your sales pipeline. So I encourage people to look at, you know, what are the core parts of your business and pull a couple of really key numbers, uh, leading, lagging numbers that, um, you know, if these things are achieved, you know what the outcome will be. So if you need to bring in 10 new sales each week, then your pipeline needs to have 100, 
you know, um, coming through that funnel, then that's your number. So, and if it's, you know, your number's 100 and you're only hitting 60 or 70 week in, week out, because that scorecard gives you 13 weeks of rolling data. Mm -hmm. So you can see those trends. And, you know, we had one situation in our business where uh, a new person started in a, in a leadership role and, started playing the the system if you like so we then when we we looked at it and and we there was peaks and troughs and when you looked back through our data and all of a sudden it was just green all the time and we went no that doesn't look right (laughs) so we dug into it found out what was happening and then put another number onto the scorecard to make sure that um the right thing was being done for the business and our vendors because our um the person was not paying suppliers on time in order to keep the bank balance looking good. Right. Um, and so we put, you know, um, a, you know, supplier invoices overdue as another mm-hmm. number on there. So what are those numbers that you can look at and know as a overall big picture, business as a whole, that, you know, everything's on track. Yeah. And when it starts to go off track, you can do something straight away because you're looking at this every week. If you look at it at the end of the month, too late. You can't change it or at the end of a quarter or the end of financial year, even worse. Um, And then your your business will get to the point where every single person in the business has one or two numbers on a scorecard. So maybe the person who answers your phone, you know, all all calls answered within three rings. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so what are all of those numbers having a person accountable for them. So they may not be the person that complete that does all of the work behind it, but they're the one who actually fills in the number on the scorecard. Mm. And, you know, it's the old red and green, you know, did you meet target or did you not? And mm. if you've got a salesperson who is not making the phone calls or, you know, following up on the leads at the start, there's no way they're going to hit their numbers. Yep. So it just gives you that visibility right down to the business. And I, I always... Uh, describe the scorecard as it's like shining a damn big spotlight into every corner of the business and there is nowhere to hide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting too. People think that um, a scorecard is like a dashboard. It's kind of set in stone and that's always going to be the same. But again, we work on this 90-day world in EOS and actually every 90 days we're looking at it and saying, hey, this is what we were measuring last quarter, which is great, but what's happening in the business right now? And so if you're struggling with cash flow, for example, you might add an additional metric that will help you to understand where that is at for the next 90 days. Yeah. And that becomes the focus for the next 90 days. Or um, you might actually recognize that you've got trends in the business and so therefore the sales number is not the same every single quarter but you know that quarter one is a big quarter quarter two is a bit of a dip whatever it might be so I think that's the important thing is that scorecards they're they're not just for the sake of kind of ticking a box and going yes we're doing our metrics it's to really help you make business decisions based on data that helps you to do that yeah absolutely yeah yeah and it, and I think it's that consistency too like you know all of these fancy dashboards they show you right now but mm-hmm. if you want to know what happened last week and the week before and the week before, mm-hmm. you've got to go and look for it. Where the scorecard, you can look at it and say, you know, these are the peaks and troughs. Um, yep. You know, that number was was it was doing really, really well. It was kind of climbing and now it's starting mm-hmm. to decline. What's changed? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's that visibility of a period of data that, as you said, can help you make good business decisions. Yeah, I love it. No, it's, actually, it's, it's really, really simple. It's really funny. I've got, you know, different clients of different sizes, different technological cap, um, capability, shall we call it. And I mean, some people have literally got, uh, you know, proper dashboards and they're using software and they're tracking all of this and seeing the 13 weeks at one glance. Um, other people have spreadsheets and they're just looking at a spreadsheet. And I've even got one client who literally just prints out. Um, they have a printed out version of the scorecard and they use a, a pink and a green highlighter to go mm-hmm. green is on track pink's off track uh, big skin. whiteboards big whiteboards uh, we used to have one in our event center we had a big whiteboard and that's where the numbers went which means we could easily at a glance see where things were at which is yeah. good yeah keep it simple absolutely yeah. One of I, I actually <laughs> i recommend that people don't automate that process whoever's mm. accountable for that number needs to go and actually fill it in themselves and take ownership yeah. because you get in and you go oh, i don't know if it's right it's red but you know it's automatic it could be right could be wrong who knows not my problem yep. <laughs> if you actually have to go and count the number yourself or find the number yourself and put it in and it's red yep. you take it more personally, personally. Yeah, and take ownership of it and that's yeah. the point 
And and the same with in the actual level ten meetings, I actually encourage the person who owns the number to be reporting on the number too. Yes. Because there's a certain psychology of like, okay, Deborah, this sales figure that you were supposed to have, you know, ten books sent out this week. Um, it's uh, I have to say, I only sent out one this week and then suddenly it's becoming you know it's a real yep it's my number I have to own it (laughs) and what we found through the process and we pushed EOS down into our business pretty quickly by uh, I was going to say request of our staff but it was stronger than that they were like you know what is this thing we want to do it to let us in let us in Mm -hmm. so we rolled it out very quickly and what happened was when people within teams were not meeting their numbers so you know you go around the sales team yep um, you know my number's green my number's green oh mine's red but it was red for the last four weeks. What are you doing? So it became that sort of peer group management and calling each other out and saying, okay, how can I help you? I don't know how to do this. Well, I can teach you that. Let's, you know, straight after this meeting, I'll take you through it again. So it became that peer group management and peer group pressure, like you said, of, you know, um, you, I don't want to be standing up each week and saying, oh, you know, I haven't oh, met my numbers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Okay, so the other tool that you talked about was rocks. And and rocks, I mean, this is not a new concept, right? I remember seeing a Stephen Covey video Back from in the, the 70s. With the big yeah. hair. Big, big hair and big shoulder pads. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but it's still, it's a very, it's still, and that's the whole thing with EOS, right? Nothing in EOS is actually new. No. It's all very, very good proven principles. But the principle behind it is that we're, we're laser sharp focus on the big things that will actually make the boat go faster um, you know point us in the right direction but how many is like an ideal number of rocks in your opinion <laughs> uh, well I think it's is it to set seven each quarter and then not do any is that <laughs> <laughs> no that's just me yeah. ah that's you that's you yeah. okay yeah okay you, you can edit that bit out um so I I don't like people to have any more than three mm. a visionary none because they just don't get them done. They they will sign up to all of them and get done, <laughs> yeah, none yeah. done normally. I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. How many is done? None. Mm, uh, rocks? No. What rocks um, <laughs> is usually the question. Two to three. Yeah. Because you still have to do your job. You have to manage your team. You don't want to be there 14 hours a day, you know, when everybody else goes, goes home, do some work on your rocks. Two mm-hmm. to three. I kind of like two. Yeah. Um, because you're just setting people up to fail yeah. if it's any more than that. And everybody and says, was... oh, but it's so important. You know, we have to get this done. Okay, so how in this quarter? It has to get done in this quarter. How long have you needed to do it? Four years. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. So do you want to rethink that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think also it's sort of it, it. It's not we're not saying that if you get those two rocks completed, you can't do more work. Yeah, but it's exactly. like get those two done first, and once and you've ticked them off, the then one. you can do something else. <laughs> but yeah, so so that, you know, don't add and subtract rocks. But at the end of the day, yeah, set yourself up for success, like you said. Be yeah. really realistic. But I've got five questions up here that I, I wanted to just quickly share about rocks. Um, so the five questions we usually ask is why do we actually need to do this rock? So you know, what does the value add to the business here? by doing this rock how will it make the business better what does done look like so if you're going to commit to a rock how will the leadership team know it's actually complete I would say what does success look like when can I break open the champagne I need to know what that actually looks like you know where does it fit in with the one year plan or the three year picture so being really really clear this is about starting with the end in mind so we've got a 10 year target our three year plan three year picture and our one year plan how does it kind of fit into that you know does it number four does it address a significant issue that stops us to getting to our goals if yes what does it do um you know how does it how does it do that um how much time will it take to complete it either hours or days so that's a sanity check isn't it to kind of go Mm. actually if you think on top of these rocks you've got all your business as usual and that's going to take up 80 percent of your time and you've probably got 20 percent to spend on this doing this rock so what is the scope and the size of the work and are we actually being realistic um in terms of you know how many rocks we set for ourselves and what the size is and then finally what are the major milestones needed to be mapped out to understand how to do it because I think you're, you're going back to your original example, you get to the 11th week and people kind of go, mm, I've forgotten what the rock was about. Whereas <laughs> if you had the milestones kind of mapped out, you could go, okay, we're at week four, we're up to number two in the five milestones. We probably are on track. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, if you're using one of the EOS software tools, and there's milestones in there, it actually makes it easy for, you know, if the integrator is running the meeting and, you know, Deborah, how are you going on that mar- on that rock? And you say, oh, yeah, it's on track. Say, so, well, but none of the milestones have been ticked off. 
Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I have done them. I just need to go and tick them off. I will get that done before the next meeting. Fantastic. Go you. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I actually haven't started. Well, it's not on track. It's off track. Yeah. So, again, <laughs> it's just ourselves. creating that, that accountability and that nowhere to hide. Yeah. But it's also the thought process of if you start that um, the thinking around that rock with what does done or success look like Mm. and then work backwards from there and create the steps it's easy to get into overwhelm I've got this rock I've got to get this big thing done in the next 13 weeks I don't know where to start it's too big I'll go and do something else and then another week's gone by, another week's gone by. So it's just breaking it down into those chunk size bits. What yep. can I do this week? And then what's the next logical step, the next step, the next step? So it just sort of takes away that overwhelhm. Mm. It's a little bit like a study plan, isn't it, when you're doing a study yeah. plan for your exams and things because exactly. I always tend to leave things to the last minute. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> oh, God. Excuse me. My apologies. Uh, okay. So we, this, uh, we've we talked about the first step is this focus day, and it really is about getting these foundational tool sets. So actually when you leave that room, you're going to start implementing some tools that will fundamentally make a difference to your business kind of immediately. Um, we're not averse to people self-implementing, right? If you want to mm. self-implement, we're absolutely fine with that. But there's a definite advantage to working with someone somebody to go through this process and you've been through it and we're now using somebody to actually help us with our um, sessions for our business as well so what do you think why would you why would you choose to do it with an implementer as opposed to just do it on your own so we had been looking for something for quite a while and we tried various other things um, you know sort of competitors to EOS we tried a couple of industry tools the big thing or two big things for us one was discipline of, of actually setting aside those days to be working on the business rather than in the business. So we knew that uh, having that implementer coming in on those day sessions mean, meant that we had to do it. We couldn't cancel and postpone and just keep pushing it back. Or oh, I haven't yep. done my rock, so let's push it back two weeks. Like that was going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I and But for us, so, so it was that discipline. It, it was the knowledge. You know, you can read a book and interpret in your own way you can skip over the the hard bits and pick the easy bits so the, the cherry picking thing which is a, a trait of a visionary you know do the easy stuff and and what you know wait till I figure out the other stuff so that that were the two big things for us was that discipline but but also the expertise we knew we needed to bring somebody in who would take us through and do it properly yeah. because we'd tried self-implementing other things and we we said at the time it didn't work. We didn't know how to make it work and we didn't want to make that mistake again. We committed to this and we wanted to do it properly yeah. because for I'd been in the general manager or integrator role, as we now call it, for 10 years. I'd been trying to get out of that role for nine years and nothing that we had tried stuck. Yeah. So we just needed to do something different yeah. and, and do it properly properly yeah and I think also I mean, if you think about I know certainly with the clients that I work with the visionary is a very strong personality it's, you know that's kind of the nature of a visionary and if you try to do that yourself or even if your integrator tries to do it there can be that tendency again of that the visionary says something and everybody else just agrees because yeah. that's what the visionary said whereas a facilitator that, that we are we can actually pick up and make sure that everybody gets a fair say in it that um, that we are actually fighting for that greater good as opposed to just going along with what the yeah. visionary says Absolutely. yeah absolutely and particularly in our case was husband and wife yeah, and yeah. um you know so excuse me um our the dynamics of, of us being married and working together for so long both being visionary um mm -hmm. and then you know we'd have conversations at home and you know in the car and that sort of thing and then sort of uh, bring our team into somewhere down that conversation so they didn't have the backstory the you know the thought process that we did mm -hmm. and we we recognized that that was difficult for our team to navigate so ha having that dynamic for us really um the eos process really worked for that because we come together yep. we talk about things in that room together rather than us just presenting it as a um as a as a product rather than a um, a discussion. Yeah. 
Okay, good. Hey, look, I'm conscious that we're coming to the end of the show. It always goes so quickly. Uh, we're going to run a whole series of these. So mm. we're just you and I talk and answer some of the common sort of questions or misconceptions or just, um, you know, giving some tips and tools around EOS. Um, is there anything you'd like to kind of finish up on just to, as a bit of a tip or a tool for the listeners? Ooh, throw that one at me without know, thinking good, about it. it. Good on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my pleasure. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think know your limitations is probably, you know, just thinking through that, you know, why did we get that implementer? Mm -hmm. If you are super disciplined and you can really dig in and put time aside and and be really structured about it, um, you know, self-implement by all means. But as the business grows and, and, you know, we sort of, you know, where we come in as implementer is around that 10 staff, it's... You know, the value of having an external facilitator come and work with you, we we just knew that we couldn't do it on, on our own. Um, mm-hmm. So if you do have a, a bigger business, um, please reach out and, and talk to an implementer. Um, if you're a smaller business, self-implement. And if, you know, one or two staff, start with EOS. You know, get some of those tools into place to start your business. Um having some structure in it is better than nothing um so yeah it's yeah. it's a it just makes you know fr- from my personal experience it makes your business your life a whole lot easier having something like eos that um yep. just spreads that load and the clarity around the roles and that's um, going back to the accountability chart uh if husband and wife particularly for nick and i we struggled for a long time around clarity of roles who did what we both did the things that we both loved to do and avoided the things that neither of us liked to do and then we got really upset at each other because um you know we felt that the other one should do it i don't like doing it so you can do it i don't like doing it either you do it i don't want to do it and all of that sort of stuff so um yeah just um Get those foundations right, get that accountability chart, get those rocks in place, uh, you know, going, sticking on that focus day. Yeah. Um, you know, it just makes business and life a whole lot nicer place to be. Completely agree. Traction first. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Well, look, Jenny, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you want to find out more about Jenny and Nick and I, you can go to businessaction.com.au or businessaction.co.nz. Um, we've got a whole lot of information about the various services that we offer for um, established kind of growing businesses. Um, Jenny, pleasure to talk to you as always. And I'll look, we'll look forward to the guests you've got coming up. In fact, just tell us a little bit about you've got a couple of really exciting guests. you want to just share that with us? Yeah. So we've got a few people that I'm going to be chatting with over the next few uh, recordings um, who are running EOS in their business. Uh, so, you know, different industries, uh, member of entrepreneurs organisation. So a few EOs around the, around the traps. A couple of guys who've written books that we'll be talking mm-hmm. about. Uh, so Will Scott, who's got uh, Culture Fix and... But the one that yep. I'm really looking forward to, not that I'm not looking forward to those ones, is Katerina Papamaku, who is a psychologist who works in the area of um, mental health in the workplace. So I'm going to record mm. a couple of sessions with her. The first one around what's happening in the workplace now. You know, we're talking, you know, all the mental health issues that are coming through um, after COVID and people getting back into the office and those sort of things, um, you know, around burnout and, and you know, just the, the different um, expectations of, of the, you know, different generations. Mm-hmm. We'll do a second one that's aimed really more at employers, how to protect ourselves in our business uh, when there are claims, particularly false claims, which is happening quite a bit at the moment. Um, you know, people going out on stress leave when they're just, you know, people, you're trying to hold somebody accountable and they go out on stress leave and they're or calling out bullying. So how to manage that in the workplace, how to protect yourself, how to protect the business, how to manage a situation like that if, if it's happening for you. So really oh, looking sounds, forward to those. Yeah, those are absolutely great. Now, now, we do appreciate that you're obviously in the middle of kind of, you know, moving house, country and everything else. Yeah. So can't be exactly sure when those will come out, but definitely keep an eye out for them. Go to betterbusinessbetterlife.co.nz. You'll find all the information there. You can subscribe on the various different podcast channels. Um, and we look forward to sharing more of our stuff with you over, over the coming weeks. Fantastic. Thanks, Deborah. Lovely to have a chat. Thanks, Jenny.